disaster. You know, disasters are quite often something that we would rather be avoiding. I was reading uh, a very interesting story about one of those disasters. But first of all, I want to just take you to a couple of places. One is Lockerbie. It's a Scottish village not far from the border with the north of England. And December 21st, 1988, that evening, the shortest day of the year, people were going about normal life there. They heard a very, very loud noise. And what they didn't expect, which was uh, completely unreal, really, was a Pan Am jet, uh, a plane full of 259 people, crashed on that village. It was a terrorist incident. 11 people died on the ground. Aberfan is a name that some people might not have heard of. It's a small South Wales mining community. In 1966, one morning at 9.15, a huge slurry, all the waste, colliery waste from the, from the tip from the mining industry that was piled up on the hill above the, the town, slipped down, became quite liquid because underneath it was a spring of water which had uh, so absorbed into the uh, colliery waste that the whole thing became unstable. It slid into the school. More than a hundred children died on that morning. Now, disasters are horrific things and things that we would much rather avoid. I just want to take you to Acts 28. And a disaster, but the amazing thing is that there's something that turns around. There's 270 people involved, as with Lockerbie, which added up to 270 people who lost their lives. Well, this un unusual story is where the Apostle Paul is involved and really looking to God for guidance and help in the midst of a shipwreck that's happening in Acts 27, 14 days without any sight of the stars and, and over in the middle of a, a vast, vast storm. They even throw the ship's tackle, the, the stuff that's going to navigate the ship, they throw that overboard. Uh, they, th they throw some supplies overboard and the ship breaks up into pieces and it gets smashed against the rocks but he says to everybody grab a piece of the leftover ship and get to shore safely and they, and they do amazingly so Acts 28 we spent a wonderful three months on Malta he says now why was that? what was special about this island? Well, this is the story of how they got there. Once everyone was accounted for and we realised we had all made it, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. The natives went out of their way to be friendly to us. The day was rainy and cold and we were already soaked to the bone. But they built a huge bonfire and gathered us around it. Paul pitched in and helped. He had gathered up a bundle of sticks, but when he put it on the fire, a venomous snake roused from its torpor by the heat, struck his hand and held on. Seeing the snake hanging from Paul's hand like that, the natives jumped to the conclusion that he was a murderer, getting his just desserts. Paul shook the snake off into the fire, none the worst for wear. They kept expecting him to drop dead, but when it was obvious he wasn't going to, they jumped to the, to the conclusion that he was a god. And then it goes on to explain how they minister and reach out to the sick. Um, so that lovely um, version that's from the message gives us a picture of the, the outcome of this shipwreck, what looks like a total disaster. And we know that disasters can be absolutely heartbreaking. We, we, it's clear that Lockerbie and Aberfan are, are very much in that category. We see a complete disaster, and yet this situation turned around. And Paul comes into Malta and actually... The islanders show unusual kindness and he and his team bring healing and restoration.
Now, one of the questions we might have about disasters is, okay, well, Lockerbie, is, was there anything that good came out of that? A, a, a town that was uh, devastated, bits of wreckage and, and bodies scattered over the fields in the, in, in the vicinity of a huge area. The fuselage came down on one of the roads, enormous crater. The, uh, the cockpit much further over, heartbreaking stories of people who came to find the leftover bits of presents and items and suitcases and clothing and people. And the relatives came who'd lost people. They came to that little village. The name sticks in my mind. It's part of my growing up history of one of those places that will forever be associated with the disaster. There was a priest in that village. Now, what's interesting, Father Keegan's was a man whose life had failed quite a lot. He was, uh, unfortunately, uh, an alcoholic and he'd messed up other people's lives, really, and had been a pretty poor priest. But he came to Lockerbie, began to settle, and, and actually things started to straighten out in his life. The people welcomed him. That man whose life had been such a disaster in many ways, when it came to this disaster, was a leading light. The first man to move back into his road as it got restored to rewrite the script of this broken-hearted village. And Father Keegan's used to receive and welcome people who came, and as, as did others, the relatives who came. One of the relatives came and got involved very early on. Actually was allowed to apparently stay in the police station and and become the sort of spokesman and voice piece and uh, point of communication for relatives. They actually didn't want people to come because if they really understood how horrific some of the killings were, it would be very difficult for them to process that. Very, very hard when people found uh, devastating outcomes from that crash. Abba Fan, 1966 is the year that I was born. 1966, the year that England won the World Cup. Some positive things in that year. But the National Coal Board was responsible for quite a lot of different collieries, different coal mining pits in South Wales. Tremendous power, and the man who'd been put in charge, some said, was arrogant. Eventually, things worked through. A barrister was there to represent the, the, the mothers, the wives, the sisters, the women who had lost so much. Horrendous things happened during that whole process after the event. The National Coal Board was in denial. The reality was very true. People had already said in that town, there's a spring under that quarry waste tip. It's not safe. It's unstable. But they hadn't listened. There was awful things that went on after that disaster. And But out of that time, really that was the start of Corporations having to take ownership, what we call corporate manslaughter, the ownership of whoever's not at the bottom of the pile, not the, the, the lowest clerk or the, or the most uh, insignificant employee taking the rap, but actually the person at the top who was ultimately responsible for what had happened in that organisation, things that should not have happened but did. South Wales is unusual because mining towns are within a mountainous area, so the colliery tips have been put on hillsides, on higher ground above the villages. And if you go to that part of Wales, you'll see quite frequently the housing is on the side of the hill, slotted in, and the coal mining uh, um, uh, entrance to the pit might be at the bottom of the valley, but the, the waste 
was put at the top. Now I'm not a, an expert on mining, but what I do know is that a lot of injustice happened. And it's taken a lot of time to work through that for people. A lot of things were done against them, which were deeply unfair and very unrighteous. Two people were accused of being responsible for Lockerbie bombing. One of them finally was brought to justice and was released back to Libya when he was dying of cancer and that was seen as a bit of a heralded victory by Colonel Gaddafi. Of course, people felt very differently. You know, people said to Paul, justice has not allowed him to live. He's a murderer. And he was. Paul had been a murderer. That's the whole point, isn't it? The Apostle Paul was someone who had murdered many. He had gone after the Christians in his early day with zeal and hatred. He was a terrorist. The man was a nasty piece of work. He went chasing after to other countries, chasing after the, the, the Christians, hunting them down. There was some truth in what the people said in Malta. This man was a murderer. But mercy seems to have come into the situation. Mercy seems to have made him the key person, the key player in turning a situation around that was going to be a disaster. Mercy meant that he had been spared the venom of the snake. And actually instead... He was a miracle and his team, miracles for healing in that place. You know, God can turn around things. I was talking to a friend today. We, long, we often have long chats. Uh, I, I come from England, he comes from Germany. Our parents went through the Second World War. I talked to his parents, you know, once or twice at length about the issues that they had experienced as teenagers, as young people. His mother, well, maybe not a length, perhaps that's an exaggeration. His mother had experienced crystal knocked at the age of nine. That was one of her earliest memories, the smashing of Jewish shops. His father had pulled the bodies out of the rubble in their German town as a teenager. My parents had experienced the air raids, the war. You know, it's hard for me, perhaps it's hard for my friend, hard for us to understand the trauma that people experienced during that. Perhaps it's hard for us to experience the realities if we've not lived through them. You know, there is a Jesus who has lived through hell and come back. He's gone through torture and come back. He's gone through the cross, public execution and come back. He has been through pain. He is the lamb on the throne who was slain. That means that, as Revelation tells us, he's someone who has suffered. He understands. You know, he talks about a time when mourning and death and pain and tears will be no more. The old order of things will pass away. And he's the one who will come. And what I like about Father Keegan's what I love about his story in Lockerbie is a man who seems so broken and failure that he was is the one who comes to minister to others and actually demonstrates something of God's compassion. And that's so true of Paul too. And I'm sure even in Abafan there were those that God brought into that situation in one way or another that were part of the answer, the barrister who stood up for the, those women who came together and decided to weep together and laugh together and fight together. And the barrister who stood up and helped them with their case and eventually, bit by bit, moved things forward and justice rolled in into that situation and you know there was the guy who was the Secretary of State for Wales much later on I think he may have been a local MP at the time actually and uh, 
One of the first things he said when he came into office as Secretary, Secretary of State for Wales was that he arranged that the money that had been taken from the charity that had been raised for the village and that money, a third, a third of the cost apparently of getting rid of the spoil heap, that money was given back to the village. There were so many injustices that happened. That was just one of the things that got put right afterwards. And there were others that got put right and resolved. You know, Jesus comes to resolve and put all things right at the end of days. He comes to restore a different order. He comes to put in place new legislation that reorganizes history. He comes to redeem and make wrongs put right. He's very much the Aslan lion that C.S. Lewis talks about. He's the one who gets rid of wickedness and injustice and darkness. He turns our winters into spring. This is the one who can change disasters and bring hope and even justice where we can't see it happening at the time. So I want to leave us just with this thought from Acts 28. It's one of my favourite chapters, I would say, of the Bible. What I love about it, it's the end of this narrative of Paul. This Paul, this man is redeemed and changed, transformed from murderer to a person who brings healing and hope and and blessing to people's lives. And I just want to leave us with that this this thought. He comes to speak to a man and uh, the head man in that part of the island was Publius. He took us into his home as his guests drying us out and putting us up in fine style for the next three days. Publius's father was sick at the time, down with a high fever and dysentery. Paul went to the old man's room, and when he laid hands on him and prayed, the man was healed. Word of the healing got around fast, and soon everyone on the island who was sick came and got healed. My prayer today is that even out of the most difficult disaster, even out of the most painful episode that we might have experienced, even out of the things that we can't even imagine people have gone through, even out of the situations that I wouldn't know what I would deal with in the middle of all that, how would, how would I cope with it? Even out of those kind of scenarios that God will bring his healing power and transform, turn bitterness into sweetness, Turn the tears into comfort. Turn the despair into hope. Turn the brokenness into wholeness. I pray that for you, I pray that for myself and those situations that might be on our mind that we might come across even today, these next days and weeks and months ahead of us. Those situations that we feel overwhelmed by sometimes and we don't know how to get our head around them. I pray that we would see the grace and mercy of God, the healing of God come into them and transform and do wonders like we saw with the life of Paul and his experience on Malta. Bless you. Have a wonderful day.